This will be the Northwest Permaculture Speaker Series for July, which is Andrew Millison. The topic will be world changing permaculture projects. So here we go. This is the July 2023 uh, monthly Northwest Permaculture Speaker Series. And um, today we have Andrew Millison, who initiated the permaculture design course in 2009 at OSU and um, is a uh, practitioner of, who is going to read this? Let's see, 27-year um, <laughs> career in permaculture uh, with water management systems as his primary focus. And in recent year, he's become a world traveling documentary, documentary videographer and uh, filming epic permaculture projects. So um, in places like India, Egypt, Mexico, Cuba, and throughout the US. Um, and he has a popular YouTube channel. So with that being said, we're gonna have, um, his presentation on his uh, uh, sharing uh, what his world tour um, findings have been and lately. And uh, feel free, everybody, because it's a small group, to uh, raise your hand as we go along. And he's willing to answer questions. So this will be interesting. And I don't think it will be more than an hour. So go ahead, Andy. All right. Um... So when I share, once I go like full screen sharing my thing, I probably won't see um, people's hands go up. So then if you have a question, you can just butt in. Okay. If you want to. <laughs> that's say like, great. hey, excuse me, and I'll just be quiet. And then I think that's how it'll work. That sounds great. We could always bring it to your attention, but I might have satellite pause. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's just do the button idea go for it yeah just do the button idea okay so whoops portland Bil village building convergence well i just gave i just i just gave this talk <laughs> on 613 2023 but today is actually 7 21 i believe 2023 um permaculture a world of lessons so i'm just going to share the most recent fascinating things that i've learned and actually i'm primarily going to talk about india because I spent two months in India uh, this winter, and this was my third two-month trip, basically traveling around the country, visiting large-scale land restoration, permaculture-type projects. And right now, um, I'm I'm steeped in doing all of the editing and graphics and everything for a video series that I'm producing, uh, India's Water Revolution 2023. And so it's what I feel like talking about, because it's just the most fascinating thing to me right now. And, and I actually can see people on the side. So if you wave your hand, I would be able to actually see you. So all right, well, this is uh, some drone footage of a village in Maharashtra, India that participated in the Pani Foundation's Water Cup competition that we'll talk about. But you can see uh, many different design features there that now dot these Indian village landscapes. So I'm Andrew Millison. Like you said, I got a YouTube channel and um, a program at Oregon State University. So that's, that's the main thing, ways I spend my time right now. And I've been very fortunate to have a symbiosis between creating media and working for the university where I've been able to do a lot of travel and focus on really trying to tell some of the most important stories on the planet, at least in my opinion. So, um, so we need to start out, like any talk I give, we need to start out with the fundamental pattern that we find on the planet on the terrestrial areas of the planet, how land is actually divided into watershed basins. 
So this is a map of the watershed basins of the world, right? And you can see, if you are into geography, you can see that some of the lines that divide these watersheds correspond to political boundaries, but many of them do not correspond to political boundaries. And that's actually, it's actually a problem. Uh, and I consider the, the fact that watershed boundaries do not correspond to political boundaries. I consider that one of the fundamental flaws of human civilization. And it is really at the basis, it's the basis for many of the problems we have can be tracked back to this unfortunate condition we're in. So here's the United States and you can see the Mississippi watershed takes up a huge portion of the country. This, the Mississippi watershed, I mean, in a sense, this is the source of America's world power, right? This is the largest navigable river system by far on the planet that reaches these navigable waterways into some of the most fertile soil on the planet. So the combination of navigable waterways and a large area of fertile soil, basically talking about the American Midwest, um, has created this like real long-term abundance and stability for the United States. So that's, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about politics, for instance, uh, and think about that in the watershed level. Then we can see the Columbia watershed up in the upper left there. That's where I live. Um, yeah, so, you know, we actually had a chance to divide the United States up into states that were actually following watershed boundaries. This is when John Wesley Powell uh, was sent by Ulysses S. Grant to survey the arid West and come back with recommendations about how to divide the country. And I mean, obviously, in the context of colonialism, they're like, the West is ours, John Wesley Powell, go out and tell us how we're going to settle it, you know? Um, and so this was the map that Powell came back with. And this map of the states actually is dividing the states and creating the states along the natural boundaries of watersheds and water lines. So Powell actually brought this idea back, but by the time he got back, you know, there was no trains or planes or any quick way to get out there. By the time he got back, Ulysses S. Grant was actually dead, I believe. And a powerful lobby, the railroad lobby actually, you know, a powerful lobby really wanted things to be divided more on a grid. So make them more, make it more easy to have the land as a commodity. And so we did not end up with watershed democracy. We did not end up with our political boundaries divided on watershed lines. And hence the fragmentation of our watersheds that we have today. So, so let's look at India. Now that we <clears throat> talked about watersheds a little bit, um, India has uh, some of the most, I mean, uh, at this point, India is the most densely populated country, the most highly populated country on the planet. It's now surpassed China this year. 1.4 billion trees, trees, am I talking about? 1.4 billion people. And the blue watershed that covers a lot of the northern swath of India there, that's the Ganges watershed. And that's one of the most densely populated, you know, the, the amount of people that that watershed feeds is, I don't know if it's the most people that that watershed feeds on the planet, but I mean, this is very dense agriculture um, that water is fed from the Himalayas and other mountain ranges. So, so India has got its own very fascinating watershed stories, just like the United States does. And uh, this last trip to India that uh, I went from December through February this last year. Um, I basically, these stars are all the different places I visited. And I'm going to tell you 
some stories, give you a little bit of a reporting from these different locations. So in the south, we have Tamil Nadu, which is um, one of the um, part of India that has had the least amount of invasions, you might say, like all of the changes in India, invasions, everything came from the north down, but a lot of things didn't get all the way to South India. So South India has a lot of very intact uh, systems, ruins, temples, is a very fascinating place. And then on the left in the center, the state of Maharashtra, and then on the top there, towards the left side of India, we have Rajasthan. So precipitation is really variable. India is a monsoonal climate, a lot of it, right? The monsoons, there's two different monsoon periods. One of them, the monsoons come from the Southwest and you can see on the Eastern, lower Eastern swath, we have that blue color, right? Which is, you know, very high annual precipitation over 2,100 millimeters, right? 1,000 millimeters is about 40 inches of rainfall. So over 80 inches of rainfall on that coast there. All the way up in the upper left there, we see the dark, that deep red. That is the Tar Desert. I visited both of those locations. Uh, I visited the wettest part of India there, and I visited the driest part of India on this last trip. Um, and some of those areas there are less than 350 millimeters. So 350 millimeters, you figure 100 millimeters is four inches. So that's less than 13 inches of rainfall. And I would say a lot of those areas are more in the range of like four inches of rainfall. Basically, many of the areas up in that deep red <laughs> zone. What was Parmesan? What was that? Oh, mute yourself there, please. There you go. Um, <clears throat> So uh, yeah, there's many areas up there that get like two storms a year, basically. Two, two, two inch storms during the monsoons. That's about all the rainfall they get. Uh, yet, it's, yet there's rain fed agriculture going on. It's very fascinating. So we'll start off in the state, state of Maharashtra. Ma, the states in India are actually divided by language. So I was just showing how in the United States, how you know, we almost were divided by watersheds. So India is like, a, it's almost like the European Union. It's really a conglomeration of all these different countries in a sense. I mean, all these different language types. So each place you go, there's a different language, there's different food, different dress. It's very interesting. But Maharashtra is the, is the state that, that Mumbai is located in. Mumbai, Bombay is the financial center of India. So, and also the, the also it's the entertainment center of India. Right, so Bollywood. Okay, so there's this guy here, Amir Khan, and Amir Khan is a very famous Bollywood star. He's like at the level of Tom Cruise, right? I mean, he's played the leading man in so many movies, he's super well known, he's a great actor, and he became aware of the plight of uh, the farmers of Maharashtra, because basically the landscape was, had become degraded. Uh, watersheds were depleted, water was running off, groundwater tables were dropping, and farmers were having to basically pick up and move if the rains failed and go and live in the slums of Mumbai and do low, low wage work just to get by. So this came to the attention of this Bollywood star, Amir Khan. And he had this TV show at the time. And so he came up with this idea. And this idea was to create a contest. And this contest was between villages. And the contest was a 45 day, the Satyamev Jayate water cup, where the villages would have 45 days to install as many water harvesting structures as they could. And this started in 2016. And you can see there the number of villages that participated. 2016, it was 116 villages. 2017, it was 1,321 villages. 2018, it was over 4,000 villages. 2019, it was 4,700 villages. 
So altogether in this four year period, because some of those villages were double, they like they joined the contest in multiple years. They had approximately 8,000 villages join the contest. Now they had, because Amir Khan so connected, he had these big corporate sponsors. And so there was big cash prizes for the village that had the most amount and the most highest quality of water harvesting structures. So there was a lot of incentive because even if you didn't win, you fixed your water table, you, re you regenerated your water table. So um, just to give you a little, the impact on water storage. So they, in, in the liters of water stored were 55,000 crore. Crore, a crore in India means 10 million. So 55,000 crores is 5.5 trillion liters of water storage capacity that was built in these villages, right? So basically 45 days, it was like midnight, the clock would strike 1201 and the villagers would go out with torches. They make a huge thing. And there was this huge volunteer effort and they would dig by hand. They would, if you, if you dug enough structures by hand, you had enough certain level of volunteerism then they would, um, the government would contribute um, heavy equipment and dig you some ponds. And so literally millions of people participated in this contest. And it really brought together the people of the village. So people of, you know, of whether, whatever political party you were in, everybody had an interest in restoring the hydrology, the water table of these villages. So this is like an aftershot of what some of these landscapes would look like here. So in permaculture, we talk a lot about on contour swales. Well, um, they do a, a version that is a little um, less likely to potentially have a problem. <laughs> so they, they call them continuous contour trenches. And the difference between a CCT or continuous contour trench was what is that's mostly what you see here filled with water. And a regular swale is that, and, and, a, and what we think of in permaculture as an, as an on contour swale is that the water is not building up against the berm of soil. The water is just filling the ditch and then the overflow is actually at ground level. So it makes it a little more foolproof than, um, the permaculture on contour as well. But basically the villagers are getting together and they are completely restructuring their entire landscape with massive earthworks all throughout the watershed. And the effects are stunning. They're digging all these structures in 45 days and then they get the monsoons. So, so basically they have three months where they get all their rain, three to four months, sometimes two months, I mean, it varies. And that water, instead of rushing out of the watersheds, that water is then soaking into the ground in a watershed scale design. And basically in one monsoon season, they are restoring their depleted groundwater tables. It's like instant gratification. And you know what this did for people is, what it did for these villages is really astounding. So. I was there in 2019 and 2020 before COVID, and I saw a lot of these villages that had like just restored their water table. So all the so the videos I made there was like, oh my God, they restored their water table. Well, here we are four and five years after they restored their water tables, and these villages that were that were really in a state of devastation are like booming, right? So when you roll around with the Pawnee Foundation, uh, this is the kind of welcome that you are met with because people are super appreciative because the Pawnee Foundation literally enabled them to completely turn their fortunes around and go from like really a stricken area where people were just like leaving or going, you know, becoming migrant laborers and you know, like really a desperate situation to one where they're in a really high state of prosperity. So this is the party and you can imagine the uh, sound that you're not hearing here. And if you watch my videos that are coming out soon, you'll get it. But people were like drumming and it's this whole big festive thing. We get there 
and they wrap the turbans around us, right? There's me and my wife. And then in the foreground there um, with the turban on, that's Dr. Avinash Pohl. Dr. Avinash Pohl is the chief advisor of the Pani Foundation. And he is the guy that he's visited like 600 villages in the last year. He is this incredible orator and like motivational speaker and super sharp guy. He's actually a, in his regular, his regular profession, he's a myofacial surgeon. So he's a guy that like reconstructs your, your jaw and your teeth and stuff. If you've had, you know, like a, some, some kind of accident or something like that. He's a really very smart, highly skilled guy. So anyway, when you roll around with him, you're like rolling around with a VIP as a VIP in these villages and you get the kind of, this kind of welcome. And um, so, you know, we get there, they bring us into the temple and we go, we like pay homage to the temple gods. And then we'll have some sort of talk with the villagers. We'll hear their story. Everything's being translated to us. Um, and, you know, I got to tell you, some of these villages, at least two of these villages, my wife and I were literally the first foreigners to ever enter these villages. This was surprising to me. I'm like, you know, the British were the colonial occupants of India for like 500 years. I don't know, a long time. It was like, the British never showed up here. They're like, no, the British ruled by proxy. The British would find some Raj and they'd be like, here, we'll give you rifles and you can rule this area. And then you collect the taxes and you give them to us. So the British controlled India with, with a, like a startlingly small amount of actual British soldiers. So there's lots of places that the British never got to. No one ever got to. So when we showed up at these villages, like this one village right here, like they literally threw a parade for us. The entire, they like called off school, the entire village came out and they dressed us up. They gave me this instrument to play. They put the turbans on and they had this parade because they were so honored that someone would come from across the planet to see the work of their village. And of course, India for Indians, like the guest is God. Like they take it very seriously. Like, so Indian hospitality is very extraordinary. And to the point where, uh, I mean, I just wanted to show this because this is how, this is how special they felt it was. They literally had a reporter follow us around in each village we went to. They wrote a whole story and took pictures and put them in the paper. It's funny, one of these, um, one of these articles was translated to me and this is a little aside, but it turns out that, um, that the reporter was really using my presence to further his own political agenda. So one of the art, it was like, oh, and you know, Mr. Millison, the scientist from America, he says that the government's not doing a good job. And da da da. da you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like, wow, thanks, dude. You're uh, you're oh, using yeah, me. Yeah, I just wanted to know what kind of insurance I need to buy to have a dumpster put in front of my rental house. The city of Eugene said I had to have, I think, $2 million incident and $3 million aggregate. Are you familiar with that kind of insurance? Are you talking to me? I am not. Well, would you check into it and get back to me either to... Can we mute you? Yeah, I did. Sorry. So hey. let's see, unmuted. Right. Phone. <laughs> I was like, uh, that's really a, kind of an off-topic question. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> I was like, uh, let me think about that. Okay, we'll, we'll answer questions like that at the end. Um, okay, so yeah, so we rolled around, so we got this big welcome, and then we rolled around and we saw all the work here um, of these villagers, and uh, there's Dr. Pohl, and, you know, traversed these landscapes uh usually starting at the top going to the top and looking at the sort of water harvesting structures that they did from the top down to the bottom of the landscape um now the thing about these villages right this is why i brought up all the watershed stuff in the beginning is because these villages are in such an old location these villages are so old that the village boundaries follow the natural pattern that we would find in the world. The village boundaries follow the watershed boundaries. So this is a village called Nandar Patar. And 
right in the center of the village, they actually have a map of their watershed, of the watershed design. So everybody in the village understands the design that they implemented at the watershed scale here that has restored their water table. So it's like public amazing. education. Totally amazing. Yeah. So yeah, super sweet right there. And I mean, I don't know what that says, but you can get, you can see there's a little key there on the side. So if anybody taking a permaculture design course, look at this, they put their permaculture design map right in the center of the village, right? Awesome. So cool. Yeah. So like I said, I mean, these villages are super old. So this one village I went to, it was, th this is the one that like threw a parade for us. Um, this village called Pemgiri. <clears throat> they have this banyan tree in the center of the village. This banyan tree here is the second largest banyan tree in the entire country of India. It covers about a, an acre and a half, this one spreading tree. And there's this crazy temple built into the middle of the banyan right here that I had to get a picture of. And when I asked uh, the guy who was taking us around, I was like, how old is this village? And he said, we don't really don't know how old this village is. It's very, very old. He said, the only, the only reference that we have for how old this village is, is that 500 years ago, there are some texts that mention this banyan tree. So, I mean, that's like, that's the only frame of reference that they have here. I was just, I actually just, um, I don't know, I don't know if uh, anybody in the call is familiar with Sadhguru of the Isha Foundation. He's one of the most famous Indian gurus on the planet right now. And I, I'll show you a project at the end of this talk that I visited his, but I actually just went and had an interview with him um, at his ashram in Tennessee. And uh, he, he, he made, he said this thing, he said, in India, we think of a thousand years ago as recent history, he said. And in America, you think of 250 years ago as ancient history. So just some perspective. So these villages, so this is Pemgiri. This is the village that that banyan tree was at. And this is some of the mapping that we've put together for the video series I'm doing right here. And so you can see on the left-hand side, I just have the satellite image with contour lines on it. On the right-hand side, I have the elevation, uh, you know, red, the red is the, are the highest elevations and then the blues are the lowest elevation. So this shows the watershed. And so this shows you that the village boundaries, this basin here, the village boundaries are the watershed boundaries here. And nearly every village, some semblance of the boundaries of the watershed boundaries. So think about that for a minute, that if a village makes a decision about what they're going to do on village lands, they're also making a decision about what they're going to do in the watershed. Because when the political boundary corresponds with the watershed boundary, then the decisions that a village makes together are also the, the, the decisions for a whole watershed. It's extremely convenient. Andrew? Yes. Is the, what we're seeing on the left is um, you get sort of the impression of development and that looks like it's the entire blue area. Is that whole area like down at the bottom of, of the picture, the village? Yeah, well, at some point, um, at some point in the lower part, it kind of blends into other villages. Uh -huh. So like where I have the little star and it says Pemgiri, that's like the actual little village cluster of buildings. And then the farmland, um, when you actually see the video, I have a boundary because like there's a, like towards the bottom of um, the, towards the bottom of the village, um, you'll see another little cluster of, uh, it looks like a little, can you see my cursor on the screen? I, yes, we can. Okay. Black and little, but oh, way down there at the bottom, he's doing- Yeah, see, that's cool. another little cluster of, of, you know, so at some point this village boundary like blends into this other village and there's other villages, you know, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, 
you have to kind of like see the whole picture to see. But basically, I guess what I'm trying to show is this whole basin here. Yeah. You know, that's all like this village's land is this whole basin. And at some point it kind of blends in this village's boundaries start. Yeah. Cool. Oops. Okay. So um, a lot of what you see in these foothill areas, a lot of the treatments they're doing again are these, they call them CCTs, continuous contour trenches or deep CCTs. And, uh, you know, people, some of the questions, some of the technical questions you get as a permaculturist, permaculture teacher is like, oh, how far apart do you space swales, right? And the, the answer is always like, it depends. But it's interesting to see here in the Indian village context where you remember they get all of their rain in a very short period of time. So they get extremely heavy rains. They have just tried to maximize water storage in this landscape. And they just have swale after swale after swale after swale, basically, because they want to be able to collect these cloud bursts. And so they might have these swales fill, you know, five times in a monsoon season. And that water percolates down. And uh, and they also can, I've heard some, you know, in this particular village that this picture is from, we had a little talk with the villagers at one of these, in one of these continuous contour trenches. And they were like, yeah, when these swales fill up, uh, it takes about eight days for that water to percolate through the ground. About eight days later, we see the river level rise, right? So when you do a watershed treatment on such a large scale, you, you start to get these interesting data points like that. This is what some of the village clusters look like there. In the lower hand, actually, you can see my cursor right here. This is actually uh, our little welcoming circle where we're all dancing and celebrating before we go into the temple. But this gives you an idea of these small clustered village centers. And then you can see homes <clears throat> dotted throughout the landscape here. And then these low plateaus and valleys. So a lot of those continuous contour trenches are done on these slopes all around. And then as the water then flows into waterways and drainages then, they have different check dams throughout these waterways to pull up the water, soak it in. And then their wells are these open wells. We think of wells, let me see what the next, yeah. I'll, I'm gonna talk about the wells in just a second here. I think one more slide. Um, but you can see here, they have these berms and they create these all throughout the drainages. They're storing water here. They have livestock walking around, water buffaloes and cows and goats coming and drinking. And then they're being shepherded around. Um, <clears throat> and they just created water bodies and water storage, maximizing that just all around the landscape, in these villages. Okay, so this is a good example here. So. When we think of wells here in the United States, we think of deep wells that are drilled with machinery. And, you know, anybody, anybody in the audience know how, if you have a well, do you know how deep your well is? Hundreds of feet, I think. Hundreds of feet. Yeah. Anybody Ours else? Is nine, 90, 90 feet. 90 mine feet. Is, mine is 240 feet. 240 feet. Right. So <clears throat> imagine what it would be like if you did not have a pump and you were just pulling the water up with a bucket and a rope. It would be very difficult at that depth, right? So in India, <clears throat> they have very little well drilling equipment. Basically, when people are talking about wells, they're talking about hand dug wells which means, so you can see here this circle, this is a well. It's a hand dug well, it's very wide because they had to do this excavation. And so when they are recharging the water table, they're recharging this shallow water table. And oftentimes um, people are then pulling water just with buckets directly out of here, or they'll stick a diesel pump in to irrigate a field. So all of these water storages throughout the whole goal is to recharge the shallow water table here. So um, yeah, so, so you see these big water storages here in the valley bottoms. And yeah, this is a really nice picture right here. So you've got water storage, you've got these check dams basically, or they call these Nala buns, that's their name for them. Um, this is us, that's me right there. And then uh, this is 
then they have wells right below these water storages. So even when this pond dries up, they then will access the stored water from underground because this water level will drop and they'll be able to still access this water. So, uh, and then you can see this real crop diversity. Remember these, these villages five years ago were devastated and I was there during the dry season. So January, December, January, February, this is the dry season where all the crops you see are irrigated. Nothing is rain fed in this season. So it's very telling. You can see the level of water abundance because you can see the amount of crops they have here. Uh, and this is actually a really nice shot of that. Uh, this village here, um, Sabargantal, this has just become this agricultural mecca. It's incredible. At some point I was like, you know, I forgot that I was visiting uh, villages that were devastated five years ago. I was like, oh, I forgot. I, I, I thought I was just vi visiting like the uh, diverse abundance of Indian agriculture because there's so much going on here. And so with these open water storages, they're pumping water from those shallow wells and they're pumping it up to these water storages. So, um, and then they're gravity irrigating down from there. So by the time the dry season rolls around, they have all this water stored up high in these lined ponds. And then they have all this groundwater. And basically if they get two, if they get one good year of rainfall, they have enough aquifer storage and then above ground storage to last them through two to three years of a bad rainfall and a poor monsoon. So they've created this buffer in the system where they now can get through the bad years because they've built up so much storage capacity underground in this aquifer. I mean, it's, it's really astounding how fast this transformation went. So um, Dr. Pohl, so here's the village there. You can see the watershed on the wall right there. And here's the little party that we were having when we arrived. Um, I have a quick question, Andrew, yeah, about, um, you were talking about like these villages being like incredibly old. Yeah. But they reached this point of devastation. Like, was that mainly like climate change, population change issues that kind of led there? Or were there practices that they were using before? Like, what what kind yeah. of got to that point? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, <clears throat> so there's a few things. Um, one, there's just the sort of natural population pressures, lots of grazing animals, kind of unrestricted, a general degradation of the watershed over time. However, um, colonialism really played a number on the Indian landscape in the same way that in the US, we were told to you know rip out all the hedgerows. Uh, with the Green Revolution, with the you know colonial, all of a sudden the commodification of everything, um, a lot of trees were removed from the Indian landscape. Trees were thought to be competing with cropland for fertilizer, for fertility, right? Um, a lot of uh, hillsides were denuded and deforested, and so. Um, the over time, you know, between those things, the water holding capacity of the landscape was degraded. And then you factor in climate change, which in India, for the most part, means higher temperatures, higher temperatures, and now erratic rainfall or erratic weather events. And so higher temperatures mean that more, um, it, you, there's more evapotranspiration. So you need more water to grow the same crop in higher temperatures than you do in lower temperatures. And so, you know, the, so the story of land degradation is, is a lot of these factors combined. And I don't know, like, at what point things started to go down. Um, I've been told, at least in the south of India, um, Sadhguru, he mentioned that the Green Revolution was a big part of that, right? I don't know if you know the Green Revolution, basically like 
the introduction of nitrogen fertilizers. We're going to put fertilizer on instead of doing biofertilizers who no longer need trees for compost. We no longer are uh, recycling animal manures onto our fields and, you know, this whole sort of confluence of factors. So, you know, when did it really start going down? I'm not, I'm not sure if it was like the 60s, you know, because that's when the green revolution really started kicking in was the 60s. Um, yeah, so I should know more about that. But that's, that's the, that's the general outline. Is that, does that satisfy your question? Kathy? Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so Dr. Pohl, he was like, he, at one point we were driving, he's like, wow, like, look at that. They improved this road. You know, he's like, how are the roads in America? And I was like, well, honestly, the roads in America are about a thousand times better than the roads in India. You know, he was like, oh, hmm, interesting. And he's like, well, what's like, you know, how's the water quality? You know, as far as like drinking water out of your taps, I was like, yeah, the water quality is really, really like significant. Like I can pretty much drink water out of any tap. And yeah, I mean, if I'm in Flint, Michigan, I might be drinking lead, but I'm not going to get um, some sort of stomach virus or, you know, some sort of like bacteria that's going to take me out, basically. Like we have drinking water standards in any city. Uh, he's like, okay, what about air quality? You know, India, basically, they practice uh, their their main waste management system is what I call decentralized incineration. And that's a really pretty word for people are just burning trash everywhere, right? It's just like burning plastic, burning garbage, pretty much everywhere you go. And there's just a constant haze of burning there's like, they call it like the Indian, the, the, the South Asian haze. It's just like this haze, uh, like, so the air quality, and especially when you get in the cities and the gasoline standards, like, man, I was like, honestly, in the US, I was like, the air quality is way better, you know, in the majority of places. And he's like, huh, interesting. He's like, well, then what is better about India? Right. He's like, you seem to really like India. He's like, what does India have that is so much better than the US? And I was like, you know, I really got to think about that. I was like, I know that India has a lot of really incredible qualities, but let me let me try to really put my my finger on it that India is so dominates the US, right? <clears throat> and it came to me because uh the in the US and probably a lot of Western sites, but the US especially, because really we, th this country is so young as an organized country, right? We've had, uh, you know, Native American populations, of course, have been here for a long, long time. Um, but there was such colonialism and, uh, you know, the expansion of Europeans across the continent was so devastating to many, Amer many Native American societies that a lot of the land use practices, a lot of the land use patterns were broken. The fire regimes out here, all these different things here. Um, and people in the U.S. move very frequently, right? Like Americans on average move their homes you know, I don't know, it was like every two years. I mean, people are moving around, they're buying, they're selling. So I work with a lot of different people, students in permaculture courses. I work with clients and the majority of the people, you're like, oh, what's going to happen to this property after like you pass? Oh, are your kids going to take this over? Right? Like, like what is the continuum of land management that's going to keep your project going? And in many many, many cases, it's like what that person is doing on that land during their lifetime is what they're doing. And there's not some sort of really reliable plan for how their permaculture design is going to continue in perpetuity, right? Now, there's certainly exceptions, like if a, say, a Native American tribe is doing a project and it's, you know, being done by the tribe or something's being done by the government but you know continuity but in these indian villages 
the expectation, I mean, these people, <clears throat> their ancestors, as far back as they can fathom, their ancestors were in this village. And their basic feeling is, is that their descendants will also be in this village. So when they are making a change like this watershed here, when they do a full watershed treatment, like you see in this mural here, it is a permanent change. As far as they're concerned, they're like, we have permanently changed our village for all of our descendants in perpetuity. So there's a feeling, there's a reality, and also just an expectation of a continuum of land management. And that is such a valuable thing that we're really missing here because the long-term effects of that when you make a change are really very stable. It, pro it, pro it provides a deep stability to your permaculture efforts, right? Okay, we're gonna, how's my time by the way? I'm just talking and talking, 4.49. Okay, so I think I'm talking more than I thought I was going to. So I can start going faster if, if you want me to end within an hour. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's really interesting information. If you go faster, I may not okay. absorb it. Does okay. anybody I'll else want to want him to finish in an hour? I'll just I'll just talk until I see all those little names on the side of the thing disappear. I'm just kidding. And yeah, just okay. a reminder: if anybody has questions, just go ahead and chime in. Just yeah, interrupt him. Yeah. All right, so we're going to jump up to Rajasthan, right? Rajasthan's up there in the deep reds, up in the upper left there, right next to Pakistan, okay? And uh, here I visited a village. So it's kind of funny, the, the number 45, because remember in, the, in, in, in uh, Maharashtra, we were visiting villages that solved their water problem in 45 days. Well, here we are, the village of Lapuria in Rajasthan, where they have been actively solving their water and associated problems for 45 years. So if you want to see deep stability, this is the desert right here. This is, this is like greening the desert right here. What have they been doing for 45 years? They have been solving their water problems. They have been, I'll, I'll get into the details of it, but basically they have been doing water harvesting structures. They have been doing tree planting and they have been doing, uh, improving their agriculture, improving their grazing methods, uh, improving their community um, and basically, in, basically building their natural resources, starting from water, right? So you look at this picture here. I mean, you see a fairly treed landscape. There's trees really mixed in with the agricultural fields. This is the desert, and this is also the desert in the dry season. So all of the green you see on the fields, that's all irrigated land during the dry season, right? So this picture, if you understand the context, uh, you get a sense of the level of resource abundance that they have here. Also, notice the air quality. That's the, that's the Indian haze I'm talking about. So groundwater recharge is the fundamental um, action that they're taking that is make enabling all this other abundance to be built here. And the groundwater recharge, again, is happening with this diversity of earthworks that they're putting in. But this is a different type of landscape. This is a much flatter landscape, which is very interesting um, because the other landscapes I was showing you in Maharashtra were these quintessential, very clear watershed boundaries where these, this is more like flat plains. And you see a lot of this, you see a lot of people, uh, women really are, I've never seen a man pulling water out of a well, honestly. Um, uh, women pulling water out of wells, putting them in pots and then carrying them on their heads to their homes. And that's the water supply right there. So you can certainly imagine that the higher your water table is, the easier it is um, to get water because it's less pulling. But people are people are carrying water. I mean, that's the level of that's the level of utilities and infrastructure that we have here. This is how most villagers are getting their water. So, uh, you know, 
by the way, some of the sub themes that you're seeing are um, patriarchy and <laughs> social structures of India. There's a lot there, and we can talk about that. Name more. it, Andrew. Yes, I know. Some... <laughs> I'm, I'm calling. I'm calling it out because it's it's kind of obvious, you know. Like it's interesting. I'll just go on aside for a second. It's very fascinating as a you know, progressive American, we've had feminism, women's rights, all this stuff. And then to go to um, like a very, a very distinctly, massively patriarchal society, it's very, you know, you're like, whoa, okay. So we'll, we'll talk more about that as different slides come up. The guy in the middle here, this is Lakshman Singh, and he is the one who 45 years ago started this project. On the right is his brother, Jagveer, and on the left is an Indian uh, water scientist, um, Vishnu Sharma, who is our translator. Now, this is Lakshman's house. Lakshman's father, and I think his grandfather, was like the original king of this area. So India did not have a centralized government traditionally. And it was all these kings and rulers of small areas. And then after independence, uh, the Indian government basically nationalized everything and took every, you know, all the all the kings and, and princes and everybody had to give their lands, you know, give their lands away. They no longer were um, like the uh, had surf, you know serfs kind of thing, and so Lakshman and Jagvir are the descendants of the king, and so they still live here in the old palace. Um, and so Lakshman was this higher caste, you know, kind of royalty, and he saw that this dam was had failed, and they'd petitioned the Indian government um, to fix this this dam that we visited, and. Um, the government had ignored them. And so one day Lakshman walks out with a shovel and he's like, I'm going to fix that dam. And all the villagers laughed at him, right? Because he was the upper caste royalty guy. They're like, you don't even know how to use a shovel, dude. And he's like, I'm going to fix it. One of his friends went with him. They started like digging out. Next day he shows up again. He shows up again. They're like, okay, I'll, I'll come help you. You know, next, by then, okay, 10 dude, you know, 10 people show up like, okay, well, I'll help. And then, you know, within whatever a month, the entire village is out there and they fix this dam and, um, or, you know, big earthwork structure like you see behind us here in this picture. And uh, they fix this dam and then they move on and they start repairing all, and then building new water structures and studying and creating this massive network and basically fix the water system of their village where when they get the monsoons, the water's going into all of these ponds and earthworks, restoring their water table, giving them water for their animals and everything like that. So I just want to say that when you roll around with uh, a guy like Lakshman, who he was an upper caste guy, but he went and just joined, joined everybody together and they fixed their water problem. And now this village is, you know, decades into prosperity it's like people walk up to this guy and touch his feet and like, like people love him. Like you can, you, it's astounding. You can see this. So this is him, you know, sitting in the center of town and here's these villager guys and everybody's just like, like, it's like walking around with a saint or something. I mean, it's very, very fascinating to go and just feel the sort of love and energy that someone gets who has, who has, altered the entire destiny of, of a whole region, really. Um, <clears throat> so we went and visited, this is them harvesting mustard seeds, right? Some women here. Again, um, it's funny, in, in the United States, we think of, we think of, oh, that's ma man's work. We have this concept that hard work is man's work, and it's really turns it on its head when you go to India, and it seems like the vast majority of all the hard work is being done by women. Um, pulling up, again, pulling water out of wells. I don't have a picture on this presentation of women carrying massive bundles of firewood on their heads, which is, you, which is something you see all over the place, working in the fields. 
you know. Um, and so this is a little example here of the, so this flatlands design of the types of earthworks they've installed throughout this flat landscape. For any of you who are trained in permaculture, actually here, if you can see my cursor, so you can see, so this here, this right here, you see my cursor, this is actually the original dam that they repaired, right? And at this time of the year, there's just a little bit of water in here. But during the monsoons, this entire thing would be full of water. And then as the water retreats, they will farm the bottom of the dam because uh, the water level's right below there. And then you can see this series of earthworks here. They have done a lot of testing of these different sizes and different types of earthwork structures. They now, they now teach many people in other villages how to do this. And then this here is the main river course running through here that now you can see like just little bits of water here. This is basically showing you the static groundwater table. So that means that, you know, the groundwater table is like practically at the surface here. And again, this is, this is February. So this is, you know, heart of the dry season. All this green land here you see is irrigated from the shallow groundwater table. And then this is the neighboring village, Gagardu village. Um, it looks the same. It's all green. There's water bodies. There's trees. Because they didn't just fix their village. They then went, and the neighboring village was like, wow, check out what you're doing here. That looks really cool. You guys, you guys have water, and we don't. How do we do that? They taught them. And then they interconnected the water harvesting structures from one village to another. So this right here, this uh, ditch right here is, is the, it's the, so when, when the pond from Gagardu village fills up, the overflow actually flows along this embankment and then flows all the way to Lapuria's village's pond. And then when Lapuria's village ponds flow over, that water flows to the next village. They've actually interconnected the earthworks between villages to maximize water holding capacity and recharge the aquifer on this total um, region-wide scale, right? Um, I just clicked the chat and I see, oh, what do the men usually do for it? Okay. Um, the men like, they are shopkeepers, drivers. They do certain, they do do, they do like a lot of construction you see men doing. You don't really see women doing construction. Um, I mean, as far as like physical work, the men are oftentimes doing the animals. They're shepherding animals. They're um, like doing a blacksmithing. Um, yeah, they're doing like some of the more, you might say technical, you know, they're driving tractors. They're still working in the fields. They're still out there. It's just definitely weighted towards women. But um, like I would say more of the sort of um, just heavy labor that takes a lot of people um, is done by women. And the men tend to have a little more specialized or easier jobs. Did you see any hemp housing in India? Fireproof, also rodent mold, termite resistant proof. President of India met with a man from Southern California who's morphing some of his building blocks to include hemp. I saw him, International Hemp Building Symposium, hemp building. Um, I did not see anything having to do with hemp there. There's certainly a lot of mud brick and mud buildings that I did see. That's like a really common traditional building material as well as thatch roofs, um, but I didn't see hemp there. Okay. Oops. Okay. So, so basically what they've created in this whole area is regional stability. This is another village. This is a really old village. When you drove around here, the little laneways were like just wide enough for the car we were driving in here. This is their old village pond here. <clears throat> and you can see really thriving agriculture, lots of trees. And this is really the so I guess I'm putting in this here because this was this other distant village, but still 
had been worked on uh, by the people in Laporia. So like their, their influence has spread throughout this entire region. So it's really phenomenal, the scale of it. Okay, last area here, let's see. Yeah, 503, okay. It's Tamil Nadu down the south of India here. So here we are down in this area that we're a little higher rainfall now. Um, a lot of this area is more like between 600 to even 1200 millimeters. So we're talking about 24 to 48 inches of rainfall. So higher rainfall here, but still very dry during the dry season. This is the Kaveri River Basin. Um, and this is the a very large river basin that encompasses areas of Tamil Nadu and the neighboring state Karnataka. And the area that I spent time in here was this main part of the basin here in Tamil Nadu. And uh, this is where I visited the Isha Foundation. And the Isha Foundation right now is their goal is to plant 2.42 billion trees in the Kaveri River watershed in order to use increasing tree cover to um, bring back the flow of the water by slowing the flow of water through the, through the watershed, bringing shade, improving soil, improving the organic matter content of the soil, and um, basically in introducing tree-based agriculture back into the population here. So one of the main things they're doing is producing trees, subsidizing the production of timber species of trees to make them very cheap for farmers, right? So people, they're producing trees now, selling them to farmers for three rupees per tree. And they're doing this all organically, the highest, um, levels of practice, organic production, three rupees. So one dollar is about 82 rupees. So about 27 trees for a dollar is about the cost, you know? So, um, and then the idea is they get in the farmers to plant these trees, but they're growing the trees for timber. So a lot of these trees are going to be thinned out maybe at 15 years, cut down maybe at 30 years. So they're introducing this whole new economic layer for the farmers, where the farmers are planting trees, harvesting trees, replanting trees. So they've like introduced tree-based agriculture as a system. So, so far they have distributed 84 million seedlings. It's considered the largest uh, refor reforestation project in the planet right now. Uh, this in the lower right here, this is a farm here where he just, he still grow. this is turmeric, this is a field of turmeric here. I'm standing with this farmer. He spaced his trees where he's still getting plenty of sunlight overall in his crops. He's just planting like the edges in uh, teak, mahogany, neem. These are very common tropical timber species. So the idea is that with more trees, they're gonna have more transpiration they're gonna have more tiny little particles from the trees, dust, pollen, fungal spores floating up the atmosphere, creating, um, creating nuclei for raindrops. And that if you revegetate the watershed, you actually will increase the amount of water vapor, atmospheric water vapor that hangs around. And you actually increase the amount of rainfall by having a treed environment. Let's check out the chat real quick. Oh, Allura Caves. I went to Allura Caves. Oh, found a decade ago to have 10% hemp. Oh yeah, I, okay. Yeah, yeah, actually someone did mention the hemp at Allura Caves. Allura Caves is unreal. It's one of the wonders of the world. Uh, okay, so it's like so, yeah. a very strange thought. <laughs> yeah. I've never had this thought before. Okay. Um, as as we as we reforest and draw the atmospheric moisture into different areas, um, is there enough, or are we depriving other places in the earth of of moisture in the air? No, there's actually right now with one of the effects of climate change for one thing is that there's more evaporation of oceans into the atmosphere. So 
there's not a finite amount of water in the atmosphere. It's not like a fixed volume that is being portioned out to one place or another. Um, and what's happening right now is because we have so much, so many degraded areas of the planet, actually this kind of ties into the next slide here. Because we have so many degraded areas of the planet, water is concentrating in some areas and is absent from other areas. So we have this whole flood drought cycle going on because forests actually moderate the movement of, the, of water in the atmosphere for more like even distribution, where right now with the degraded landscape situation, we have a more uneven distribution where we have higher rainfall areas in some places and drought in other places, right? So this is a little, a little diagram of how the major forests of the world actually interact with some regular movements, you know, create flying rivers, right? The Amazon's flying river provides 70% of the rain for Southeastern South America, right? Some 80% of China's rain comes from the West, thanks to the Trans-Siberian flying river, right? So it's like, that's this right here, the boreal forests of Siberia. So yeah, um, so basically <clears throat> the reason why Sadhguru is trying to plant 2.42 billion trees is to create 33% tree cover over the state. And 33%, one third tree cover is what's considered needed around the planet basically to stabilize, at least in India, they've come up with that number to stabilize the atmosphere, right? So it's kind of a good goal to, you know, and so he's like, like, standard reforestation projects have had a lot of flaws because if the population doesn't have an incentive to grow the trees, uh, then a lot of things like they'll go and cut the trees for charcoal or fuel. So, so this project by the Isha Foundation isn't just planting trees, it's creating an economic system for the farmers to incentivize the farmers to continue to plant trees. So they're planting, they're cutting with an overall growth in tree cover, although it's still going too slowly. Just a little example, I had someone do a, uh, a little analysis here, normalize the normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, shows that this one site here, this is the turmeric farm, how it increased um, from January, 2018 to 2023, over five years, how the overall um, like amount of green vegetation that we can measure from satellites increase. So it's definitely working on the farms that are taking this up. So the Save Soil Movement, um, that's Sadhguru's current, current project here. And uh, <clears throat> this lower left here, this is from, uh, it's something like, wait, was it globalforests.com? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I wish I would have written the website here. It's a, a it's a, a website that tracks forest cover over the planet. And you can see that in this Kauvery watershed basin right here, in every single one of these counties, the overall forest cover has gone up since in the last 20 years, from 2000 to 2020, basically. So there is success. I don't know how much of this is directly attributed to the uh, Isha Foundation's project, but it's happening, but it needs to happen a lot more than it is, of course. And yeah, we had a couple people here take permaculture design certificate online, OSU, and here you are excited about permaculture. So hopefully you continue to do that. I have so many videos on my YouTube channel all about this stuff. I've got my new India videos that are poised to come out very soon. Um, just put my name in, Andrew Milson. Um, and yeah, the revolution continues. I have a, I have a trailer up there, kind of gives you an overview of the series I've been producing. Um, but otherwise, like we should probably have the first videos up within within a couple of weeks. The first uh, we have four Pani Foundation videos coming out. Then we have the Cobre series, and that is my talk. So any more questions? 
All right, the secret to soil, how permaculture principles have been applied in New Zealand, Australia. When drought happened, flights overhead saw verdant farms versus the other dried ones without permi knowledge. A lot of the stuff you can see from space. That's when you know your project is at the, the right scale is when you can see it from space, you know? Yeah. Could I say something, uh, Andrew? Yeah. I, I took a workshop for Bill Mollison when I was uh, at the Bioneers Conference years ago, and, and uh, we went to Marin. And uh, one thing he taught that I shared with people, um, the only thing you have when you die is what you have given away. Mm -hmm. That's a great phrase. I thought you might want to share that with people. Also, yeah. I, I wanted to talk with you sometime about that liberated salad, which I've been doing for uh, over 35 years. I've distributed 4,000 packages to people from 150 countries, and I'm trying to pass this whole modem on because um, I'm an older gal. And so uh, that's why I called you a few months ago and left my number. But I'm just saying that liberated salad is one answer to world starvation, biodiversity at the table eat a piece, plant a piece. And um, it's an Ahimsa gardening technique that mixes a hundred different cultivars in a package. And then you uh, grow those twice a year in the Willamette Valley, which is the best place in the country to grow liberated salad. So I just want to share that with you as another permaculture technique. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. And Hannah Lee is a current PDC Pro student. All right. Excellent. Glad to have you. I'm a little behind, but I'm working on getting caught up. <laughs> it's a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of work. So that's okay. Yeah, they were, we were behind the whole time, finally caught up, gave us extra time. They were great. You'll do great. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Thanks. <laughs> so you get yeah. lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, yeah, thank you. It was fascinating. It was thank really you. Fun. Um, yeah, and I'm really, like, like I was just saying, like, like we're really close to starting to release these videos. I keep saying that it just takes. There's so many details, you know. Yeah. But um, definitely. Uh, I think we have a link. I'll make sure that we have a link on our speakers page in your box, um, yeah. in your bio area to your YouTube channel. Yeah. Then it'd be good. So, uh, spreading out the the um, concentrations of not drought with more trees won't be a bad thing <laughs> that'll be a good thing right there's no lack of moisture we can pull from the air it sounds like to answer my yeah, i lost it i lost you for a sec um there's no lack of um pulling moisture from the air oh there's shaley yeah i'm just really excited to hear this it's very timely a friend of mine who grew up in just like an old undeveloped village in Nicaragua was talking to me about irrigation. They hand dug a 50 some odd foot well and have water now, but we were looking at their site and there is like a little bit of topography and um, just like they're kind of like their family and their cousins in this village. And um, I'm gonna show them your presentation as part of like us talking about different irrigation. The, the weather patterns in Northern Nicaragua, Nicaragua seem very similar. So, well, thank you. Yeah, and I've got to say that I've got to say that this, uh, the reason why these videos are taking so long to come out is because, in part, um, I'm getting very technical. Like I'm doing a lot of technical illustrations of these structures, so people could actually like pause and look at the structures. I'm really explaining which structures are located at what levels in the watershed. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to make it well, both fun and interesting, but also um, very instructional. And so um, I'm just like, because I do have people contacting me from all over the world. In fact, in recently from Bolivia and Mexico, I've had people say, oh, we're starting a water cup competition here in my area. You know, it's kind of taking the Piney Foundation's idea to get people this whole like competition thing. And so this next, the first four videos I'm going to put out, the Pawnee Foundation ones, is sort of like a complete package that expl that really explains the details of which structures they're putting at where in the elevations in the watershed. And so, um, anyway, for like people in Nicaragua, they're like, "Oh, wow, that's so cool!" Like, there's 
there's some stuff coming that I'm hoping is going to be very um, useful to, to people on the ground, basically. Yeah. Yep, worth it. It's totally worth it and make it instructional as well as fun and interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds great. Um, let's see. Shaley says you inspire me to look if there's any projects like that there. I would go ahead, Shaley. Unmute yourself. Wait, wait, wait. Unmute yourself. <laughs> there, there's like 14 farms where they were kind of a, a different system, but where they would have um making little reservoirs where they could open a kind of like make a, a temporary floodplain by opening it up seasonally to try to catch water from the monsoon. So there's a yeah. little bit, but it's all brand, brand new. So cool to like contrast that to these systems that have been in place for a long time in India. So anyways, just sharing yeah. that if you have anyone you wants to see what is going on in similar patterns. Thanks. Yeah. And the only, um, the only thing that's going to save us at this point is like people just taking matters into their own hands at this, you know, that's my opinion. It's just like, that's, that's the only thing that's going to have any sort of substantial momentum right now. I mean, we can't sit here and wait for the governments to like figure out carbon credits or whatever. Like we're not getting anywhere like that at this point. So it was pretty inspiring speaking about speaking of people taking it into their own hands. It was very inspiring how the ex royalty or the descendant of royalty, but I mean, even, even that the, that the village downstream, um you know they were all the villages were cooperating together to create this stability in the area regional stability that is so inspiring it's like it's happening but yeah. only more people really realize that um they have to you know we can't depend on anybody else we have to do it ourselves we need well, and, it's, and it's self-interest yeah. you're like yeah. wait a minute you guys are like making more money than us <laughs> you know <laughs> They're like, hey, you're like, what? How? I don't understand. Like, you guys are growing a crop right now. We don't have any water. They're like, oh yeah, this is what we did. They're like, oh, you know. So, I mean, a lot of these projects, there is an there is a huge economic incentive right. for these farmers because these systems are creating higher productivity, multiple cropping seasons that they didn't have before. So, that's like the magic of the up up uptake is that it's making people more more well off yeah and improving their are you are yeah. you seeing um i wonder if you asked or looked at uh other regions saying hey that regional stability now is you know can we do that so if it spreads from region to region maybe it'll somehow spread from country to country yeah and i mean a lot of people that watch my first video series from india are in india so you know, there's definitely like something sticky there. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, especially when you get like nationalism behind it too, you know, people are like, oh, our country, we're doing this. And I don't know. It's like, you're, I, I mean, I'm always just asking like, you know, religion, not like what, what moves people? Can we, can we have whatever moves people? Can we use that to repair the planet? You know, so yeah okay well good job and thank you so much um glad we had you a part of our series okay. yeah thank maybe you. a year a year from now you'll do it again yes awesome <laughs> all right great great have a great weekend everybody